please join me welcome Dr. Wilson Pierce. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. Um, you can see from my last name and from all the departments I've been in, I like really long names, apparently. Um, so, so yes, I was a, a mathematician. And little known that you can actually get a bachelor's in mathematics, which is what I did, which is extra, you know, extra math courses. But then nobody ever gives you a slot to tick that off. So it was always a BS. And so it wasn't a, what I thought would be more exciting. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is sex-biased evolution and disease. Um, these are all uh, mammals that I've studied, but they're not a project that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, so my interests are basically in sex-biased processes. And these fall into three broad areas. And that is sex chromosome evolution. Uh, males have an X and a Y. Females have two X chromosomes. It's one of the most sex-biased processes that we have. Um, the second is looking at how sex-biased processes affect genome evolution, so differential mutation rates in males versus females. And the third is how sex bias processes affect diseases and how people respond um, to different diseases and, and health outcomes. So here's some other publications just to show you that I have experience um, in these three areas, uh, working on them. Some of them um, I did as a, as a graduate student. Some I've been working with undergraduates, and I'm the PI working with a student trying to understand evolutionary strata. Uh, the, the, the pictures came from this project looking at variation and substitution rates and male mutation bias correlating with life history traits. And that was across the 32 mammalian genomes at the time. Now there's 37, well, 36 mammalian genomes and an, and an outgroup that we could extend it to. Um, but we can read all those papers later. So what are we going to talk about today? So today I'm going to give you a little background about sex chromosome evolution. And then I'm going to talk about evolutionary strata. And if you don't know what that is, that's fine. I'll explain what it is. It's related to uh, the process of sex chromosome evolution. And then we'll look at selection on the Y chromosome in humans. And then end with a sex-biased disease, which is rheumatoid arthritis. And some work I've done there. So here's a human karyotype. So we all have two copies of all of our chromosomes and an X and a Y chromosome. And these are fascinating to me because they were once identical. And now females have two X chromosomes, uh, males have an X and a Y. But over the last 200 million years, they've become very different from each other. So the X chromosome has about 155 million sites on it and 1,100 genes. The Y chromosome is about 60 million sites and only 23 unique genes. And this has happened over the last 180 to 210 million years. And one of the questions that drives my research is, how did they become so different? So here's a, a kind of a cartoon of what the ancestral autosomes look like. So we'll make it into a cartoon here with A, B, C, D, and E um, representing the order of the uh, genes on the, on the X chromosome. And what happened at some point, oh, so, so you'll notice that all of them have a partner. So they can all recombine. They can all swap DNA um, at this ancestral state. At some point in the history of the sex chromosomes, an allele evolved a sex-determining region on the Y. And at this point, it's just an allele. It can swap back and forth between either of the chromosomes. The individuals that inherit this SRY allele will uh, develop testes and make sperm. And the individuals that did not inherit this allele will, will not. And there's actually a super cool strawberry, a wild strawberry, um, where they just have, they don't have whole chromosomes, but they have an allelic variant that determines male and femaleness in these strawberries. So um, it seems pretty reasonable that this is how genetic sex determination would start out. But then over time, the incipient Y chromosome will accumulate some genes that are beneficial for males and deleterious to females. So we call them sexually antagonistic genes. Um, and what happens is that it would be very nice for those to occur together. So if an inversion occurred that kept the sex-determining allele with the sexually antagonistic allele that would sweep through the population, um, and so you can see here that uh, we have a y, uh, inversion on the Y chromosome. Um, and while that's very beneficial, now region, that region of the Y chromosome can no longer recombine with the X. And so it's more likely to accumulate deleterious mutations because it cannot fix them. And Genes in this region that's not recombining will become X and Y specific. So now they're no longer alleles. Now they'll become uh, unique genes. Um, well, they may have their own allelic variants. But. 
So we'll look at this real quick. So we have uh, ancestral sex chromosomes with your sex-determining allele, your sexually antagonistic allele, one inversion, and we'll say there's a second inversion that occurred. And what's the difference between those two? Well, the X and Y pairs in the first inversion will be much different from each other. They'll have accumulated many more mutations because the combination will have been suppressed between them for much longer. And then the X and Y pairs in the second inversion will be more similar to each other over time. And so do we actually observe this on, on the human sex chromosomes? And exactly yes, we do. Um, so a paper from Lon and Page in 1999 showed that across the length of the X chromosome, they observed four distinct groups where uh, along the y-axis is the synonymous substitution rate, or how similar are the x and the y copies. And so you can see they have uh, one very, very old group where the x and y genes look extremely different from each other, a slightly younger group where the x and y-linked gametologues, uh, sex-linked homologues, look fairly different from each other, and then a third younger group that are, are, are very similar to each other, and then some that have not accumulated very many differences from each other at all. And so when they were looking at these, they said, well, that looks kind of like evolutionary strata. It looks like a strata in the Earth of different ages, only we flip it a little bit so that the youngest inversions or evolutionary strata are one uh, near the short arm of the X chromosome, and then the older strata are, are near the, the long arm of the X chromosome. And after they did this synonymous substitution rates, um, Ross et al. in 2005 suggested there was a fifth evolutionary strata where Group four was actually split between two. Um, they used an inversion analysis to suggest this, comparing inver uh, inversions on the Y relative to the X. So this is all well and good. There's five evolutionary strata, maybe. The problem is, is that we look at even young sex chromosomes. So this is a Selene latifolia. It's a plant that has very young sex chromosomes. They're about 10 million years old. Selene latifolia already has three inversions on it. Selene latifolia is 10 million years old. Mammalian sex chromosomes are 200 million years old. It seems like we probably had many more than five inversions on our sex chromosomes. But strata are very difficult to assess because the current methods require that you're comparing X and Y linked sequence. But the Y has lost 90% of its genes, so you're limited in the power that you have to detect these evolutionary strata. So the question is, can we develop a method that will work independent of having homologous X and Y link sequence. Um, yeah, so that's that question. Can we identify evolutionary strata using information from only the X chromosome? And I hope to convince you that yes, we can. And we published this um, in Genome Biology and Evolution earlier this year. I um, worked mentoring a graduate student on this. So there's one other thing that's very important before we get into how we develop this method, and that's understanding the effects of recombination suppression on the X chromosome in mammals. So ancestrally, each one of these blocks is, uh, you can think of it as a gene, and colored means that they're expressed. So ancestrally, both males and females will have two fairly large uh, sex chromosomes, and genes will be expressed from both copies on both of them. You'll have equal dosage. Um, we showed uh, in a paper we published earlier this year that in response to gene loss on the Y chromosome, the X inactivates genes on one copy. So you may have heard about the, the bar body. In, in female mammals, one of the X chromosomes is inactivated. But in fact, the entire X chromosome is not inactivated. About 10% of the genes escape inactivation on this chromosome. And 15% of the genes on that inactive X are escaped in some females and not in others. And this seems to be genes that were recently pseudogenized on the Y chromosome are the ones that have a heterogeneous escape from X inactivation. Well, what does the process of X inactivation entail? Um, well, uh, some work from my thesis lab showed that genes that are subject to inactivation accumulate certain DNA motifs around them. Specifically, genes that are silenced tend to accumulate line elements around them, and genes that escape inactivation have alu elements around them. And so what we can come up with are some expectations. So that sequence within an evolutionary strata, within one of these inversions, will have been accumulating mutations and elements related to X inactivation for the same amount of time. So it will be compositionally or homogeneous within that strata, but heterogeneous from the neighboring strata, which will be accumulating mutations and differences and repetitive elements for a different amount of time. So we develop a recursive segmentation and then clustering algorithm, but I'll go through it here in words first, and then I'll show you a picture. Um, 
So we compute a value of divergence for every position along the X chromosome. This is not pairwise divergence. This is actually using a single X chromosome and looking at every nucleotide position along the X chromosome and comparing the composition of sequences on one side compared to the composition of sequences on the other side. And um, we use jensen shannon distance to, to measure this. And then if the max, wherever the maximum value of D is, if it's significantly different on either side, then we segment there, basically cut the DNA there. And then we follow this recursively for all subsequences and then stop when none of the regions are significantly different from each other. So what does that look like in pictures? OK, so we have our, our whole segment that we're looking at. We find the value where the divergence is maximum, segment. And then we look again, find the value where divergence is maximum, and we segment. And then you can see that there's somewhere, there's no significant difference, but there's one more. So let's segment again. And now we have five distinct clusters here. So we, we actually do. Uh, segmenting and clustering algorithm where we hyper-segment it to find precise boundaries and then uh, cluster them all back together. And this seems to work uh, uh, pretty well for finding unique boundaries. Uh, but then you'll ask, does it actually work <laughs> for finding uh, different evolutionary strata? So the first thing that we did was applied it to the previous strata. So along the x-axis are the regions of uh, strata 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, as previously described, and I'll box them for you. Um, and then along the y-axis are the clusters that we identified. And so you can see we do fairly well with 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1, and you'll say, wait a minute, what about 3? There's two big ones in 3, and you told me that that's only one. And I'll say, this was so exciting because it confirmed some work from my thesis where at the same time two groups, one uh, a group in Lyon, France, suggested using inversion analysis that there was a breakpoint here in stratum 3. And then uh, some work I did using a phylogenetic method, looking at the, the grouping, the clustering of the X and Y homologs, also suggested that there was a breakpoint there in stratum 3. And now using a third independent method, we also say, yes, stratum 3 is probably at least two independent strata, 3 A and B. I think we'll just have to throw the numbering out eventually, start over. Because what we can now do is apply it to the whole X chromosome. So hopefully we'll identify some novel boundaries. And what we did, so I'll show um, the human X chromosome is composed of an X conserved region that's shared across all therian mammals, which is all marsupials and the eutherians, and then an X added region that was added to the theory, uh, eutherian sex chromosomes after marsupials diverged. Um, and it's just important for a little later, but you can just keep it in the back of your head. And so uh, those. Boxes are the genes that were previously assayed, so I'll, I'll, I'll box them here again for you so you can see. And then along the y-axis are the clusters that we identify. And so what's, what's kind of nice is that we see stratum 5, 4, 3, A and B, stratum 2 I'll come back to, and then stratum 1. And I want to point out real quick that previously stratum 1 was 100 megabases and suggested that all of that was one big inversion. But with our analysis, we suggest that there were at least five inversions in stratum 1. And actually, what we think happened is here is SRY and a sexually antagonistic gene. And we think that recombination suppression probably began here and then uh, expanded out on either side of it. And it just quickly reached that end of the, of the sex chromosome very quick. And um, this, this has been seen to happen in other sex chromosome systems. The papaya uh, X and Y system actually has the, the middle segment of the sex chromosome is the combination suppressed, not, not just the end. And then what I thought was kind of interesting is that if we find one segment that doesn't have a Y homolog in it. So this segment, this inversion that we're, we're supposing is an inversion, um, could never have been identified using traditional methods. So we'll go back to that stratum 2. And what you might have noticed on the, on the previous one and on this one is that in both cases, we think that stratum 2 and stratum 3 are merged together. And I think this actually makes a lot of sense. I think the original analysis probably saw that this X conserved region, um, it knew that these genes, these two blue genes, were shared across all Therian mammals and that these ones were in an added region. It might have made sense that they would have been split apart. But what I think this tells us is maybe we can learn a little bit about the ancient biology. Perhaps this was an ancient pseudoautosomal region when this whole X added region, this autosomal trunk, was added to the sex chromosomes. And subsequent to that addition, this underwent an inversion together. So the question is, what are we identifying? So if we 
go back and look at all of the clusters that we identified, and I take the X chromosome and I remove all of the repetitive elements. These repetitive elements that we think are important for X inactivation, what does the clustering look like? So I'll show you that here. Um, and we get the only boundary we find is between the pseudo-autosomal region, which is still recombining, and the rest of the sex chromosome, um, the non-recombining region. So it seems like the repetitive elements are really what's driving the signal. And when we look at that and we break it down, we see that among the repetitive elements, these repeat masker um, line elements are really the bulk of what we're picking up here. Um, so what about the homologous chicken region? So the X added region, the X conserved region, are homologous to chicken chromosome 1 and chromosome 4, and the gene order and content is relatively well conserved. So we applied our clustering and segmentation algorithm to these homologous regions to see what sort of clusters we get. And I will tell you now, it's the most boring plot ever, because we don't observe any clusters at all. And the reviewers will tell you, you can't include that as a main figure in the paper because it's so boring. I'll say that's very exciting because it tells us that we're, what we're picking up is something that's happened since, these, since the X chromosome became an X chromosome. It's not an ancestral signal. It's not something left over. So it's a supplemental figure. You <laughs> can find it there. Oh. Um, so our conclusions here is that we developed a recursive segmentation and clustering algorithm. We use it to identify novel evolutionary strata on the human sex chromosomes, um, applying it to the human X chromosome in the absence of Y sequence information. This is really amazing because of the 36 mammals that are fully sequenced right now in the 44-way alignment, there's more and more that are coming out. Um, all of them were female, which means they have two X chromosomes and no Y sequence information, except for human and chimpanzee. And there are labs that are sequencing Y chromosomes. So a mouse Y chromosome was released recently. The cow Y chromosome will be released. But for the most part, you get a lot more bang for your buck if you sequence a female, because you get 2x coverage of the X. And ha, that was pun. OK. Uh, but I'm funny, people. Come on. OK. Uh, and so it, and, and the Y is very difficult to assemble. It's highly repetitive. It takes a lot of time, a lot of extra effort. So I can't foresee any time in the near future of switching to sequencing males to getting Y chromosome. But now we have a method that we can get a glimpse into the evolutionary history of the sex chromosomes using just the X chromosome. OK, so after each inversion event, the Y chromosome will degrade more. There's no recombination, no homologous recombination with the X going on, so it will accumulate del deleterious mutations, because most mutations are neutral or nearly neutral. Uh, <clears throat> and so in 2006, Jenny Gray put out this paper that lots of people love to cite, because what she said is that uh, perhaps if gene loss on the Y chromosome is linear, then in Four and a half, five million years, the Y chromosome will disappear. And the news was like, oh, Y chromosome is disappearing. Uh, maybe. OK. Or perhaps it will just go extinct next week. That could happen. Uh, perhaps it will asymptote out to zero. Or maybe selection is acting on the Y chromosome. And maybe it will stick around for the foreseeable future. And so what is going to happen to the Y chromosome? I will predict it now, and you can tell me in five million years if I got it right. Ah, so here's sex bias genome evolution. So although we focus on the Y chromosome, and we're going to look at some population genetics here of the Y chromosome, I'm actually looking at the whole genome. And we're comparing patterns of diversity across the, the whole genome. Uh, and oh, this was just accepted at PLOS Genetics last week. I'm so excited. So um, you'll be able to download it soon. But it's already on the archive if you want the slightly older version. OK. so. What about the Y chromosome? Y chromosomes across males are fairly small. I, I already told you that, you know, that they've lost 90% of their gene content. But they're also very similar to each other. So diversity has been observed to be lower than expected across Y chromosomes. And people have been debating in the scientific literature whether this is due to unequal sex ratio or whether it's due to selection. And so what is this unequal sex ratio? Well, if you have Variance in male reproductive success. So this is not saying that there's fewer males in the consensus population, but there's, just, there's fewer males whose Y chromosomes get passed on to the next generation successfully. And so generally, you might think that there's equal reproductive success, that the ratio of the number of males to the number of females is 1. And we are going to test the null hypothesis that demography, or fewer males contributing to the next generation relative to the number of females, can explain low Y diversity. Or the alternative hypothesis that other forces must be invoked to explain low Y diversity. 
And so um, what we did is we used the complete genomics, uh, publicly available data, looking at 16 unrelated males, eight Africans and eight Europeans. They have different demographic histories that we can test. And this is 30 to 60x coverage. And we filter out sites that are under selection or difficult to align regions. We filter out coding regions, regions far from genes, um, repetitive elements, the hypervariable region on the mitochondria. And we calculate diversity on the autosomes X, Y, and mitochondria. And we correct for different mutation rates in these different genomic regions. We used human chimpanzee um, divergence to correct for the different mutation rates, it would be nice to be able to use human macaque. Um, when I first started the study, the macaque Y chromosome wasn't available. It became available after we had submitted, and I did try to look at it, but the Y chromosomes are so divergent that very little of the non-coding, non-repetitive DNA aligns between human and macaque. Um, so we, we ran coalescent simulations. I looked at neutral demographic models for Africans and Europeans and increasingly skewed ratios of the number of males and number of females that are contributing to the next generation. Okay, so here's actually what the observed data look like. So these are all the um, diversity for the XY and mitochondria relative to the autosomal diversity. And the, the little bars there are just what our neutral um, expectations are. And they have different demographic histories, so we do expect Africans to be slightly higher and Europeans to be slightly lower. Um, but what's really obvious here is that diversity on the Y chromosome is extremely low. So we confirm that. Great, but can we actually explain it? So the, the first model is looking at equal numbers of males and females, and you can see that it doesn't fit at all. Um, so if you focus on this middle one with the Y and autosome ratio, we'll just go through these other ones. So as we decrease the number of males that are contributing to the next generation, our diversity on the Y, our expected diversity on the Y will go down, 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 but not down that much. And you can imagine a scenario where we skewed it so much so that there were one male for every 100 females for all of human history, and maybe we could explain the low Y diversity, except that it actually wouldn't explain the patterns of diversity on the X autosome or mitochondria also. So when you look at the genome-wide patterns, you don't get a good picture using just skewing the number of males that are contributing to the next generation. So definitely there is some variance in male reproductive success. There is some level, but it, it's not an extreme variance and it's not enough to explain the low Y diversity. So if demography alone is not enough, what else is there? Well, there's purifying selection. So purifying selection acts on linked neutral sites. On the Y chromosome, there's no recombination over most of the Y chromosome. Um, so everything is linked. So if you need to get rid, well, if selection gets rid of a, a, a very deleterious mutation, then it will get rid of all the linked neutral variation also. Uh, so we did an approximate, we took an approximate likelihood approach and we did forward simulations. We used different demographic histories for the Africans and the Europeans um, and modeled purifying selection in two different ways. So the first one was to look at selection acting only on the single copy coding sites. And I'll explain the Y chromosome a little more here because I didn't give you everything you need to know about it yet. Um, so the Y chromosome is basically composed of these three, three regions that are colored, and you can see they're all interspersed across the Y chromosome there. But the first one we're going to look at is the X degenerate region. So these are derived from an ancestral, the ancestral autosomal pair. They're, they're things that have been retained over 200 million years of X and Y diverging from each other. And some work that other people have done in humans and primates and work that I have done in mammals has shown that purifying selection is still acting on these regions. So it seems reasonable to expect that purifying selection acting on the X degenerate regions might be sufficient to reduce Y diversity. Um, so we looked at uh, a variety of models with different strengths of selection and uh, distributions, and none of them fit. Okay, so... A model of purifying selection acting just on the coding regions is not sufficient. So we can check that off our list. So the second thing we did is looked at selection on coding and non-coding regions um, and estimate what is the total number of sites that would be needed to be affected by purifying selection to reduce diversity to the levels that we observe. Uh, we use a gamma distribution of selection coefficients. And here's the second region of the Y chromosome, the ampliconic region. So these are highly repetitive palindromic, which means that one, they're in these big arms, one arm is very similar, nearly identical to the other arm. Um, they might have up to 76 copies. They're expressed exclusively in the testes, 
If you delete them, then sperm do not form properly. Uh, many cases of male infertility are linked to deletions or odd uh, goings on in the ampliconic regions. So here, we're going to show you the maximum likelihood estimate of the number of sites uh, acted on by purifying selection. So here's the number of coding regions. It's actually 5.6 megabases of ampliconic regions on the human Y chromosome. And then what we see is for both Africans and Europeans, even with dem different demographic histories, uh, the estimated maximum likelihood estimate of the number of coding sites falls right nicely in between the number of coding sites and the number of ampliconic regions. And we did this both assuming uh, equal uh, success of males and females and uh, a high variance in male reproductive success um, in both Africans and Europeans. So I think what this tells us, though, is that, OK, we do observe that diversity is very low on the human Y chromosome. But demography alone is not sufficient to explain that low Y diversity. And we need selection to explain some of it. And selection acting on the, these ex-degenerate coding regions and selection acting on these highly ampliconic regions, which is kind of exciting because most studies don't look at the ampliconic regions. They're highly repetitive. They're very difficult to assemble. You can't get a good read on them. But I think what we're saying is they are very important. And we do need to study them more and try to figure out what's going on in these regions. I think a lot of people here study copy number variants. This would be a great system to get into. Um, but we don't exclude recurrent selective sweeps. So it could be purifying selection. Positive selection would give a similar signal. And right now, we don't test between those. Um, and likely, it's probably some combination of the two. OK, so what does that mean for the Y? Well, I think it means that selection is going to kick in, and the Y is not going to disappear any time in the near future. Um, don't quote me on that, because it can go extinct next week. And it has happened in some mammals, but don't worry about it. They still have males. There's these Okinawa spiny rats. Females are XX, males are X not. And they get along just fine. So I don't think we're going to lose it, but if we do, don't worry. OK, so let me switch bases one more time and talk about a different as aspect of sex bias evolution. And that is a sex bias disease, rheumatoid arthritis. This is a project I recently got involved in um, to do the, the bioinformatics work for. So I'll give you a little bit of background about what rheumatoid arthritis is and why it's so important to study. So rheumatoid arthritis is not age-related arthritis. Um, it, it generally affects these peripheral joints. Um, it's an autoimmune disease. It affects about 1% of the population worldwide. It affects three times more women than men. Um, it's, chronic in, it's characterized by chronic inflammation and generally later onset in the mid to late 40s, although many people get it well before their 40s. So here, it, this was so striking to me when I first saw it. So on the left, you'll see uh, a, a, a healthy human hand. And on the right is a person with rheumatoid arthritis. And you can see it, it, it eats away at their joints. And it's extremely painful. It's debilitating sometimes to daily activity. Um, RA can also affect your other organs, your eyes, your lung, your skin, uh, your spleen. Um, it can lead to this vasculitis here in, in the bottom right-hand corner. And up here, although uh, rheumatoid arthritis leads to the kind of the degradation of the cartilage in your hands and external joints, um, it can lead to these nodules. This is actually cartilage um, that's accumulating in different regions of the body. So it's a very odd disease, I think. Um, also, increased risk for premature mortality. That's you know a big one. So what causes RA? Well, <laughs> it's, it's unknown yet. So there's a huge environmental component. There's a time component, some amount of chance, and a genetic component. And the genetic component is where I come in to understanding this. So the risk of RA is increased uh, in monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. It tends to run in families. And the sibling recurrence risk, or this lambda S, is between 2 and 17. So it's the prevalence of RA in siblings of affected individuals versus the, the prevalence in the general population. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with lambda S, so let me give you a, a frame of reference. So lambda S in cystic fibrosis, which we know the gene that is most often involved in cystic fibrosis and alleles that are linked to the disease phenotype. Uh, it's a single, well, well, for the most part, a single gene causing this disease. Lambda S is 500 
Okay, so lambda s of 2 to 17 is, is relatively small, but it's quite similar to uh, lupus. Lambda s is around 14, 15 in lupus. And type 1 diabetes, uh, lambda s is around 20 in type 1 diabetes. So these diseases that we know have a genetic component, um, maybe it's not a single gene. That's what lambda s of 2 to 17 tells us, is that RA is not caused by a single gene. So there's been several uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, the, the first gene identified as MHC explains about 14, 15% of the variance in uh, RA. But here's what's really interesting, is the influence of pregnancy on RA. And so in 1936, uh, or 1938, sorry, Dr. Philip Hench noticed that his patients with RA got better when they were pregnant. Um, he postulated that there was some anti-rheumatic substance X that was changing during pregnancy and making them feel better. Independently, Dr. Edward Kendall isolated cortisone, and together they used it to treat rheumatic diseases. And this worked out pretty well for them. They won the Nobel Prize in 1950 for this. And they said that you know, they found the reversibility of certain rheumatic and non-rheumatic conditions. But despite winning the Nobel Prize, um, this pregnancy-induced anti-rheumatic substance X is not cortisone. That's not what's changing during pregnancy that's making people feel better. So it's still out there. And so I'll show you some studies that have tried to identify you know, how many people actually feel better during pregnancy. So there's about a, a dozen studies here. And patients with improvement during pregnancy ranges from a low, a low of 39% of patients feel better, their symptoms go away during pregnancy, and a high of 90 91% of patients. That's incredible. This is a natural system. This is, it's not a mouse model. We're looking at humans who get better with their disease during pregnancy. Um, I mean, granted, mice are great because you can tell them when to get pregnant and you can measure it throughout. But, but you have a lot of other variables. So the mouse model system for RA does not have the sex bias in it. So human RA is three times more women get it than men. But in the mouse model system, that's not the case. So, so it's, it would be great to be able to study this in humans. Um, also, so there's this huge amelioration of RA during pregnancy. Patients say it's the best treatment they ever had. They wish they could stay pregnant forever. <laughs> yeah, they may change their mind eventually, but um, it begins during the first trimester, and the amelioration gets better and better throughout the third trimester. But then it comes back and it flares in the third trimester, or the three to six months postpartum. Um, Curiously, women who experience amelioration during a sing the one pregnancy often experience in subsequent pregnancies, but not always. So some yes, some not. And I'll, I'll get to that here, actually. So our, our goal and overview. So our goal is to study gene expression throughout pregnancy, and secondly, to investigate the effect of pregnancy on RA disease activity. Um, so we assembled a prospective cohort of women with RA who are planning a pregnancy. We measure their disease activity before, during, and after pregnancy. And then we assess correlations between their gene expression and disease activity and, and other correlates. So we have, we're collaborating with the National Health Registry in Northern Europe. We have over 500 patients planning a pregnancy. Excuse me. They uh, almost have four grandparents of the same ethnicity and no other autoimmune diseases. So although many autoimmune diseases occur together, um, in this study, we really wanted to focus just on RA. Um, MS does get better during pregnancy with many patients. Lupus does not. So it's not all autoimmune diseases. Um, some other diseases that we're not entirely sure what causes them, interstitial cystitis, which is a basically painful bladder syndrome, seems to get better during pregnancy. Um, also, uh, some people with chronic migraines tend to experience fewer or no migraines uh, during pregnancy. This is all tends to, not everyone does. Don't get pregnant tomorrow, fix your headaches. But uh, there will be more headaches, I promise. Uh, OK, so, so that's our, our prospective cohort. Um, here's, here's what the patients get. So they get this, um, this person to fill out their tender joint count and their swollen joint count. This DAS is disease activity score based on 28 joints. There's a DAS 56 that's based off their hands and their feet. Um, but this is what rheumatologists use, their tender and swollen joint count, and a measure of their C-reactive protein, this inflammation marker. Um, we have the tender and swollen joint measurements from a nurse. And each patient sees the same nurse for every visit. 
and we also have it from the patient measured. And I've done all this analysis both ways with the patient reported and the nurse reported and get practically the same results. The, the ranking of the genes is nearly identical in both cases. So that's, that's fairly nice to see. There's a high correlation between patient reported and nurse measured. Um, so just so you know what the, the scores look like, they range from you know two to six, roughly. So hopefully everyone in this room would, would measure less than 2.6. Uh, and oh, so what we did, uh, measuring gene expression. So here's where I came in. So they, they used Illumina HiSeq 2000 paired end uh, sequencing samples prepartum, first, second, third trimester, and three, six, nine months postpartum. And RNA seq analysis. So we have a total of 82 samples with four technical replicates. And I need multiplex, remove the barcodes and adapters, remove the uh, trim the low quality reads, uh, assembled all of them, mapped them to the human reference genome, called the transcripts get an output of the fragments per kilobase of sequence per million map reads, which is what we use in the estimate of the gene expression. I also uh, upper quartile normalized these so that um, genes of a very low effect wouldn't get washed out by everything. <clears throat> ah, but there's one additional variable, and that is medication. So we're working with patients in Northern Europe. In the US, uh, doctors traditionally say, get off all your medication, everything. Don't take anything while you're pregnant. Um, and there are these uh, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs that you have to get off at least three months uh, before conception. And one of the, the, the drugs that's used most often is methotrexate. This is also used to treat cancers of the bone, blood, breast, head, and neck. It's pretty nasty stuff. It's so nasty, in fact, that online in, in the health indications and in, in contraindications says this medicine may also cause birth defects if the father is using it when his sexual partner becomes pregnant. So for people planning a pregnancy, um, fathers are recommended to get off of it at least three months before conceiving. Mothers, at least three months, and they need to have had two regular menstrual cycles, menstrual cycles before they conceive. So, so these ones they have to get off. These medications they have to get off. But there are other medications, um, steroids, that can help with some of the inflammation that uh, that might occur. So I, I, I told you that up to 90% of patients experience amelioration of their symptoms. So that means at least 10% of patients have the same symptoms or their symptoms get worse during pregnancy. And so patients need to take into account their quality of life and talk with their rheumatologist and their obstetrician and figure out for their quality of life, do they need to take some of these medications while they're pregnant? And some of them do. So we have to account for that. So to do the analysis part of it, we used a linear mixed model, and I'll walk you through this. So we, uh, we're we looking at variation in gene expression and how that correlates with uh, the mean effect of the disease activity, um, their pregnancy status at the time, uh, the mean effect of medication. And it's a linear mixed model because our samples, we have multiple samples from the same individual. So we want to uh, account for a random effect of each individual um, over time. And so what are our preliminary results? Um, well, I think fairly excitingly, we found about 200 genes whose gene expression is significantly correlated with pregnancy status. Some of these genes are involved in preeclampsia and preterm labor, and uh, a gene involved in milk production, which I thought was, was fairly interesting. Um, we also find that pathways involved in the innate immune system are significantly overrepresented. And I'll tell you what was very surprising to me at the end is that I thought, oh, well, what does healthy pregnancy look like? We don't know. There are, we don't know what prepartum, pre first, second, third trimester, and postpartum gene expression look like in healthy women. Yes. So if we're trying to compare the gene expression, we do know it for some farm animals. But we are not always. We're doing it a whole blood. And so we also have the proportion of the different cell types in the whole blood. So there are things that we can look at, but most studies of gene expression during pregnancy are looking at the placenta, uh, looking at changes from third trimester to postpartum. But I was really surprised, and that's part of what's driving my future research, actually. Um, so our conclusions here is it's surprisingly one of the first genome-wide RNA-seq studies across prepartum, pregnancy, and postpartum in humans. Um, 
We do uh, confirm that the innate immune system is involved in pregnancy. I think most of what we're picking up are changes during pregnancy. Yeah, no, I'm actually, it's one of the reasons being here would be great. Um, trying to collaborate with other people looking at, at gene expression changes during pregnancy. And we've identified candidate genes for future study in healthy women. So future directions from this work um, is to take this algorithm that we developed for looking at evolution, evolutionary strata on the X chromosome and apply it to other mammals where we don't have any information about their Y chromosomes. See if we can start to learn a little bit more about the evolution of uh, differentiation on the X and Y chromosome. Um, two, try to distinguish between positive and purifying selection. So I have a collaborator that's collecting samples across the world, and we can look at patterns of diversity and the topology of the tree um, to see if we can try to distinguish between recurrent positive selection or, or purifying selection, or perhaps some combination of the two on the Y chromosome. And with the rheumatoid arthritis study, we're, this was preliminary data. We're still collecting more data from patients who are pregnant. Um, but my interest now is actually continuing on and, and really investigating healthy pregnancies and seeing what that variation is um, across women across different populations. Uh, so I'll acknowledge my thesis advisor, Katerina Makova. Um, Rasmus Nielsen has been my generous host at Berkeley, giving me some space in the lab to work with. Um, and then some collaborators on the Evolutionary Strata Project with Rajiv Asad and his student, uh, Rabi who I mentored, and uh, Damini Jawahir is at the Children's Hospital of Oakland Research Institute. Um, and uh, undergraduate, I trained on the statistics part of that RA project. So thank you all very much for your attention, and look forward to your questions. Thank you. It's very nice. Um, I'm wondering, what do you think is the role of DNA methylation on the X chromosome in identifying the boundaries of these strata that you are trying to uh, you find? So I'm not sure how much DNA methylation will play a role in identifying the strata themselves. I think it will be much more important for identifying genes that are subject to or escape inactivation. Um, I think the strata themselves are inversions on the Y chromosome, and then that look, you know, we find a signal on the on the X. But if you have some ideas for how that might contribute to identifying inversions, I, I'm I not do, sure. I mean, the idea is that your boundaries between these strata will likely be less relevant transcriptionally, right? Yes. And so you think that the methylation uh, signal there will be heavier or you know more pronounced than the rest of the X chromosome. At is the that, boundaries? Yeah. Why? I'm just I'm just asking if you oh. had a chance to look at that or you're thinking about this as a way to maybe correlate some of your strata findings with, with the methylation patterns. I guess I'm still unclear about how methylation would give a signal about an inversion. Well, the idea is Because that, in females, there will not be an inversion, so they still okay. will recombine along their entire length. Um, All right. Thanks. Oh, gosh. And that's what we really need to hear. All of it is computational. So um, I do comparative genomics with the whole genome sequences. With the first project, um, we developed this algorithm to apply to the sequence of the X chromosome. Uh, the second project was looking at nucleotide diversity across all of these sequences, um, doing simulations um, in MS and in SFS code, and writing some in house scripts for parsing the data. Um, one thing that I do have to take into account is that uh, variant colors aren't always designed for the X and Y chromosome. So I had to do some of my own recalling of the raw data on the X and the Y chromosome here, and the mitochondria, in fact. Um, they called the mitochondria using, assuming that it was haploid, but because of heteroplasmy. And the mitochondria, uh, it led to a lot of no-call complex sites that were actually just heteroplasmic uh, within the cell. And so we had to, had to redo that. Um, and then the third project with the RA, although we're collecting patient data, it's all RNA-seq. So I kind of walked through the parts that I did there, removing the adapters, working 
uh, with aligning them with different algorithms, calling the different transcripts, uh, doing the regression analysis. So maybe just getting into more depth and the soft talk on those, on the computational and algorithmic and methodological aspects from computational bioinformatics approaches as well. Okay. So, Melissa, I have a question. I, I missed a point. Um, those strata, are they mm -hmm. shared by all the mammals you study? Mm -hmm. Or because some of the newer ones that are for higher mammals? Ah, so, so far we haven't compared strata across the mammals. So we've only applied it to the human X chromosome right now. Um, one of the challenges with applying it to the currently sequenced mammalian X chromosomes um, is that they were all aligned pairwise to humans, so they weren't de novo assembled. And so I can't completely trust that the signal we would be getting would be from the X chromosome because it, would, it should look like the human X chromosome because they were aligned pairwise to it. Now, not all mammalian X chromosomes are that way. So there are some that are uh, de novo assembled by different groups that are not in this 44-way uh, alignment. So eventually you can date the strata and see which ones can trace back to chimps and further back? Exactly, yes. So we can use this and see which strata are shared across mammals, which happened in the ancestor before the mammalian radiation, which were primate specific, which are human and chimp specific. Other questions? So I don't think that we would be able to see that very well. Um, if so, an overlap. So we're not actually able to see if there's, especially there's a lot of internal inversions on the Y chromosome, and those won't be picked up at all because what we're really picking up is what I think is signals of X inactivation on the X chromosome. And so it doesn't matter if it overlaps some of the old one. Um, it's really we're just picking up what's the furthest region out that was incorporated in the m most recent inversion. So so we wouldn't pick up on that using this. So you were talking about the um, relative diversity of, of X's and Y's in, with respect to demography in humans. And I know you've looked at comparatively um, X and Y diversity in a number of other species as well. Have you looked at uh, some of the, how those things might correlate with like the tree traits or other mating systems or other things across mammals more generally? Uh, it's something I'd like to do, actually. So yeah, there's not a lot of diversity data for the Y chromosome in non-human species. So uh, that's something that may need to be generated, or it may be available and just not assembled yet. So there was this great diversity project that Jeff Kidd was a part of, and I haven't looked at it yet to see if they had Y chromosomes or not. Um, but that would be the first place that I would look. 